And I'm going to turn it over to Derek. Hey, thank you, Danielle. Uh, good morning. My name is Derek Diaz. I'm an attorney at the Federal Trade Commission at its regional office in Cleveland. And I'd like to thank you uh, for inviting me to take part in your meeting this morning and to allow me to talk to you about cryptocurrency and some scams uh, that we've been seeing at the commission uh, relating to cryptocurrency and things that people can do to avoid finding themselves um, being affected by those type of scams. <clears throat> so uh, before I get started, let me tell you a little bit about the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, you may have heard of it before, but maybe not know exactly what uh, the mission of the Federal Trade Commission is. And the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, is a federal agency that's been around for over 100 years. Uh, it was created in 1914. And the mission of the Federal Trade Commission, uh, as established in the Federal Trade, Trade Commission Act, is to uh, uh, police unfair and deceptive acts or practices that occur in the marketplace. So we are, our goal is to protect consumers and free and fair markets. And we do that through uh, consumer uh, initiatives. And we do that through bringing enforcement actions against fraudsters and scammers. Uh, we also have uh, a large section that is devoted to uh, combating uh, what's called monopolistic practices. So, you know, companies that get too big and can apply monopoly power to a marketplace and then increase consumer uh, costs, well, that's that's an unfair or anti-competitive trade practice. And that's one of the things that the Federal Trade Commission is um, charged with uh, enforcing and uh, prohibiting under federal law. So one of the things that uh, we deal with um, at the Federal Trade Commission is uh, our scams related to cryptocurrency. And uh, we, we have a consumer database where consumers can report uh, information that they know about scams or frauds. Um, and many of the consumer complaints that we get involve cryptocurrency um, as, you know, as of the past few years. And so this presentation is kind of like a summary of the different things that we see and the different trends that we find uh, in our complaints and in, in the work that we do for consumers. <clears throat> Let's see. All right, so uh, what is cryptocurrency? Well, uh, it's different than cash that you might carry around in your wallet, and it's different than like a credit card that you might use to uh, purchase um, things online or in a store. It's it's a form of digital currency that only exists electronically. Um, in other words, it it exists in the uh, in the uh, cloud somewhere, and it, it's it consists of a, a like a lot of numbers and uh, digits that that show different transactions and who owns what or who um, traded what sort of Bitcoin with somebody else. And uh, there's no like physical like representation of something like Bitcoin. Bitcoin's probably the most popular cryptocurrency out there. You know, there's no like green paper um, dollar bill that you have, for instance, with the US dollar or even a coin or something like that. There's not a real coin. It, it's it's all a series of, of data, like I said, that exists in the cloud. And uh, Bitcoin is actually not the first type of um, monetary system that uses kind of a decentralized means of paying um, in, in a way directly between people. Uh, the, the, the first type is basically like paper money and uh, paper money allows you to, to exchange uh, the value of goods or services with another person. And uh, the paper currency, it's basically like un, untraceable more or less. So, um, you know, if, if you hand somebody uh, a $20 bill to buy something, then there's typically no record that that $20 bill uh, was involved with that transaction. So um, cryptocurrency has, has some of those 
kind of characteristics, but are, are different. And so one of the main things with cryptocurrency is that you don't need like a third party, like a bank or a credit card company to be involved to handle the transaction. It can just be handled between you and the seller of whatever you're, um, you're trying to purchase. Now, and now, unlike with cryptocurrency, if you're buying something with a credit card um, or with a debit card or buying it online in general, there's usually like some sort of third party that's involved, whether it's a bank or a credit card company. And then when you get a third party involved, there can be like a uh, kind of a, a trail or a record of who was involved and who handled the transaction. So what are the types of cryptocurrency that are out there? Uh, you've probably heard of Bitcoin. That's the most popular one. Uh, this chart is showing you uh, the most popular, the 15 most popular types of cryptocurrency that are out there. Um, as of a little while ago, some of the other ones that are out there uh, are known as like Ether, Dogecoin, XRP, Stellar, Polkadot, uh, and et cetera. So this, this chart just kind of gives you a general idea of um, the different types of cryptocurrency that are out there. Now, how is cryptocurrency different than the US dollars that you carry around in your wallet or that you bring to the bank to be deposited? Well, first of all, cryptocurrency accounts are not backed up by the government. So for instance, if you go to the bank and you deposit $100, then under federal law, um, your $100 is protected as long as you don't have a certain amount in your bank account or more than a certain amount in your bank account, usually like $250,000. Um, so if you have less than that amount, then if the bank goes out of business or somehow loses your money or something like that, then in theory, your your money that you have in in the bank is protected and backed up by the U.S. government. Cryptocurrency isn't like that. Um, there, if you have money in your cryptocurrency account and your account gets hacked, or you uh, accidentally even transfer money to someone else, like that, that cryptocurrency value is gone, and there's typically no way for you to get it back um, unless that person voluntarily sends the money back. It's kind of like handing someone um, a, a $20 bill and then that, that person walks away and there's really no way to like actually force that person to give that $20 back, uh, that that paper bill in, in most circumstances. So that person leaves and you never see him again, your $20 is gone. Cryptocurrency is the same way. Um, also, Another difference with cryptocurrency is that the value uh, changes a lot and it can change very drastically. Whereas the value of a dollar or, you know, government currency, it goes up and down, but not nearly like the wild swings that you see with cryptocurrency. Um, so it, with something like Bitcoin, the value can change, you know, hour by hour, day by day. And maybe one day your account shows a, a value that's worth many thousands of dollars. And then like a week later, uh, that same account is showing a value of like a lot less than that, just a few hundred dollars. Um, that's kind of the, the nature of cryptocurrency. And if your the value of your cryptocurrency goes down, uh, there's no guarantee that it will go up again. Um, so uh, there's there's uncertainty with cryptocurrency, unlike what you have with uh, you know, with traditional money. So how do people use cryptocurrency? Well, in a, in a number of different ways, typically the most common way is they use it as a, as a means of investment. You know, they take their, their U S dollars and they use it to buy a certain amount of Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency. And then they, they hope that the, that investment grows in value over time. Um, but again, you know, the value of cryptocurrency can be very volatile going up and down, um, at different times. 
Um, so there is, is risk associated with using cryptocurrency as an investment. Um, but, you know, some people get lucky and, you know, a lot of money can be made if you, if you make the right investment decisions with cryptocurrency. Uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency can also be used to make like quick payments. You know, there are certain websites that you, you can go to that allow you to pay in uh, various ways. And those ways might include Bitcoin. So um, if a seller offers you a variety of ways to pay, you know, credit card, debit card, PayPal, uh, they might also include Bitcoin. So it, it it's kind of a, a way to use um a payment system on the internet. So um, one reason why, another reason why people use cryptocurrency is because they believe that it creates um, some sort of anonymity um, that they might want for purposes of their, their individual transaction. You know, maybe they're, they're buying, selling, or they're buying something or selling something that they don't necessarily want their name attached to. Um, then, one way to kind of create some distance between the identity of the buyer and seller in the transaction is to use cryptocurrency. And another reason that people use cryptocurrency is to avoid transaction fees that regular banks or credit card companies might charge. Um, typically, a cryptocurrency transaction would just happen between the buyer and the seller, and you wouldn't need that third party to um, carry out the exchange. All right, so um, how does cryptocurrency work? Uh, you might have seen some different like pictures or graphics that explain how cryptocurrency works. Um, and there are a variety of different ways to explain it, but this, this chart uh, attempts to you know, kind of lay it out in a way that uh, makes sense, more or less, or that's hopefully easy to understand. It basically starts out with someone requesting a transaction, and then that request gets processed through uh, a network of computers, and then the computer network kind of validates the identity of the, the seller and the buyer, and then uh, approves the transaction and verifies the parties involved. And then once the transaction is verified, then the computer network adds this line of data to the Bitcoin itself, um, which identifies different types of information. It could be the buyer and the seller or digital wallets or what have you. And then at the end of it, the, the uh, transaction is complete. So one thing to know about cryptocurrency is that in order to, to use it, uh, you need an account. So you might think of it like, like a debit card. So if you want to use a debit card to buy something, you need to have that debit card attached to a bank account. And the same is for cryptocurrency. So um, you would first set up an account with a company that deals with cryptocurrency, whether it's Bitcoin or something else, and then you would... Uh, use dollars, US dollars to buy whatever amount of the cryptocurrency. And then you would have that account um, with that company or that broker or whatnot. And then um, that account would function kind of like a wallet from which, you know, money or the value of the Bitcoin could be taken out or put in depending on whether you're buying or selling things. So, what happens as part of this process I mentioned a little bit earlier is uh, kind of essentially like this data uh, exists and it's attached to every Bitcoin. And it's basically like a running list of, you know, who the first owner was and then who sold it to the next person uh, on what date. And then it was sold to the next person and so and so on. And the data is encoded a little bit more than that. But that's essentially what it is, like a long running string of every transaction that that particular Bitcoin has been involved in. Now, the data that is attached to that Bitcoin it doesn't necessarily have your name or your, your address or something like that. It may just have um, the, the particular wallet or Bitcoin uh, uh, cryptocurrency wallet that you're using 
And so, you know, most people wouldn't know what that wallet is or how to identify it. But, you know, we've gotten to the point in society where, um, you know, law enforcement and other people, companies are sophisticated enough that they can take this kind of encoded data along the, uh, the Bitcoin and figure out who owned what and who transferred to what when. So um, we've come a long way. And uh, so for the, for the most part now, it's possible for law enforcement and, you know, even fraudsters and scammers to figure out uh, the identity of people who were involved in the transactions that are encoded into a, a particular Bitcoin or other form of cryptocurrency. So uh, you probably heard with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency, it's referred to as a blockchain. And the blockchain is basically what I'm talking about in this long string of data that's attached to every Bitcoin and that gets longer and longer um, every time that Bitcoin is traded to someone else. So uh, the three elements that you need for any sort of cryptocurrency are uh, the first one is a, uh, a a bunch of connected computers that are referred to as a peer to peer network. These computers are like cooperating um, on the same uh, means to to accomplish a particular goal, and then the computers have an agreement about how they're going to process certain data and how certain data will appear and what that data will mean to that group of computers. And then that data is shared uh, in the blockchain among all of those computers on the uh, on the uh, blockchain. So, uh, how do you get and store cryptocurrency? Uh, so, the main way is you you go online and you sign up with a company that's either a broker or broker of cryptocurrency or they they distribute their own uh, cryptocurrency and then you create the account like i mentioned and then you you put your own dollars into it and then you're given so much credit in the form of uh, the cryptocurrency however many bitcoin another way that uh, people can get uh, cryptocurrency uh, and bitcoin is by a process that's called mining and that's basically uh, this process where uh, a computer is given um, kind of a very complex math problem to solve um, in order to support the cryptocurrency trading. And then when the computer solves that uh, complicated math problem, then the computer is awarded a certain number of, of credits of Bitcoin or whatever other cryptocurrency there is kind of as a reward for solving that math problem. And then that that award of credits kind of then enlarges the pool of uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency that's available. And that sort of mining technique uh, requires very sophisticated computers. It requires a lot of electricity. Um, and then the, the people or the companies who do this, they have like entire server farms that are set up with big cooling stations and they make all kinds of noise. There are actually a lot of these in Ohio they're kind of a new thing. And um, a lot of people who live near them think they're kind of a nuisance really because they're just so loud with all of this uh, air conditioning that has to go on all the time. And then uh, once a person gets a uh, certain cryptocurrency or the value in their account, then that information is then stored like in a digital wallet, uh, either on your computer or an external hard drive. And then it, it's encoded into that data, like I said, that's attached to a particular Bitcoin. Um, and how do you pay with cryptocurrency? Well, like I mentioned, you, you pay online um, through, through a broker or through a company who deals with cryptocurrency. But when you do, uh, you should realize that there are certain very important differences between paying with cryptocurrency and paying with dollars or through a credit card or even through like a debit card. And the first of these is that 
cryptocurrency payments do not come with legal protections. Like when you transfer a, a Bitcoin to someone else, that transaction cannot be undone. Um, Bitcoin itself doesn't take any responsibility for undoing transactions or investigating them. It's like I said, it's it's basically the equivalent of handing someone else a $20 bill and that person can walk away and you never see them again. Now that's different than say when you buy something with a credit card or even a debit card. If you buy something online or even in a store with a credit card or a debit card, then United States law gives you certain protections for using that form of payment. So for instance, if you order something online with a credit card and that thing is never sent, the seller never sends it to you, whatever, you can go to your credit card company and say, I dispute this charge because the seller never delivered it to me, so I never got the value. And then under US law, the credit card company has to credit you back that money that you uh, paid as part of that transaction, but never got the never got the item in question. So um, that's a very valuable legal protection that all of us have when we use credit cards or uh, there are different protections that attach to debit cards. But I will tell you, and I tell all of my audiences, uh, when I give presentations about this sort of thing, um, if there's there's nothing else you remember about what I'm telling you today, you don't remember my name or my face or whatever, I want you to remember this. This is the, the most important advice I could give you. To the, As much as you can when you buy things, either in person or online, use a credit card. And again, the reason um, why it's 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 best to use a credit card is because of those legal protections that attach uh, and give you almost as much um, protection as you can possibly hope for, you know, in dealing with uh, buying and selling items. Uh, so um, if, if possible, I highly recommend using credit card rather than a debit card. The legal protections that there are for debit cards aren't nearly as good. I mean, there are some of them that you know, kind of help out and whatnot. Um, but you have far more protection using a credit card. Um, so that's my big advice today. Um, and like I said, cryptocurrency, going back to cryptocurrency, the payments typically are not reversible. So it's like someone walking, like I mentioned, walking away with that money in their hands. And finally, uh, some information about a cryptocurrency transaction will likely be public. Um, basically, it, the way the cryptocurrency works, like I said, is it has all of this data that's attached to the to the Bitcoin, and that data has to stay there forever, basically, because it kind of shows the record of what went on. So, you know, in theory, years and years down the road, someone could trace that data back down the line and see. Uh, who was involved in the different transactions. And like I mentioned, you know, it might not necessarily have your name on it or something like that, uh, but it could have, uh, you know, information tied to your digital wallet. And then it's not that hard to, for, you know, people who know about this sort of thing to unpack the information from a digital wallet and then figure out that, okay, well, actually, John Doe, you know, in Toledo, Ohio, bought this. Bitcoin on such and such day. So let's talk about some common cryptocurrency scams and how to avoid them. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, scammers are always looking for ways to deprive you of your money. And um, unfortunately, cryptocurrency is, is um, a very convenient and easy way for fraudsters to get that money uh, from people. So one of the big things to know about identifying fraudsters and scammers with cryptocurrency is that they often uh, require you to pay by cryptocurrency. So if you're dealing with a, a, a seller or a buyer that requires you 
to use cryptocurrency, that's a pretty big red flag that, you know, maybe this, this uh, person or this business is really not on the up and up and um, they're just looking to take my Bitcoin. So like I mentioned, there are plenty of reputable businesses out there that offer you the option of using cryptocurrency as one way among a variety of different ways to buy something, you know, whether it's eBay or whatnot, but, you know, eBay doesn't require you to use cryptocurrency. And if the only way to buy something on eBay were through cryptocurrency, that might be a pretty big sign that um, it is not a legitimate business. And those same ideas apply to a company uh, if you're looking to do business with a company and they they require you to pay through like gift cards. I mean, that, that's another common tactic that fraudsters use um, to to get money and basically make it untraceable is to require people to pay in gift cards. Um, and then that that value is transferred. And then, you know, 10 seconds after the transfer is complete, the gift card value is is gone and you'll never see it again and it can't be undone um a similar similar type of idea applies if a company requires you to pay um by wire transfer like very few transfer very few transactions in the world have to be um process through wire transfer and if they do it's typically like you got to go to a bank physically and, and make it happen uh, but if a bank is requiring you to or excuse me if a company is requiring you to use a wire transfer that's that's a red flag um, that the company is probably not legitimate so let's talk about some of the more common types of cryptocurrency scams that are out there the, uh, the main one are uh, investment scams, and these are where scammers more or less uh, guarantee that you'll make money, certain amount of money, a lot of money. Um, they can promise like big payouts with uh, guaranteed returns or whatnot, um, or free money. And they, they typically make these claims without like a lot of details or explanation about how, how this is going to happen. Um, some of the companies, uh, will, will say, Hey, we want to help you invest your money and you can do that. You can invest in cryptocurrency and we'll help manage your cryptocurrency account or portfolio. And, uh, what they do then is then you, you don't really have, uh, easy access to that account. Instead, anytime you want to deal with the account, they charge you kind of like a hefty fee. And so their services really aren't that valuable. But what they're doing is they're they're charging you these hefty fees every time something goes on um, in your, your uh, cryptocurrency account. So that's a type of a scam out there. Another type of scam involves like recruiting others. So the, a company will say, "Hey, you know, if you if you buy a certain amount of uh, cryptocurrency, then you can use that money and you can go out and recruit more people. And then the more people you recruit, the more cryptocurrency you earn. And uh, in the end, that ends up being some sort of like Ponzi scheme. And you know, you can never get the value out of that. Basically, if a company is telling you like." You know, there's a guaranteed rate of return uh, on on something like uh, it's it's probably not true. Like the only type of close to guaranteed things that are out there, they're not cryptocurrency. It's maybe like a certificate of deposit that you can get in your local bank or something like that. But anything short of that, there's really no uh, guarantee uh, for any investment. And sort of like big payouts, you know, oh, double your money in three to six months or something like that. You know, if it, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And then, you know, you, one thing about these scammers, like I mentioned, is they typically don't give a lot of details about how their investments work or whatnot. So 
if you're dealing with a legitimate company or a legitimate investor, a leg legitimate financial advisor, then they typically are very willing to talk to you and share their information about their investment strategies and how everything works. Um, so you get a better idea that way. Some other type of cryptocurrency scams that we see a lot involve romance scams. Uh, when people are contacted through online online dating sites or whatnot, and they're they're sent like text messages, and they the fraudsters kind of like tap into people's emotions, and they get them, you know, believing that the the fraudster is you know this wealthy person or has all this this. Uh, inside information about investing and then um, the person on the dating site asks for you know cryptocurrency to be paid to you know for this purpose or that purpose um, typically if somebody that you've met through a dating site or whatnot asks you for cryptocurrency it's probably a scam and you should be very wary um again if if you transfer that that cryptocurrency value, um, it, it's typically gone and you won't get it back. Another type of common scam that we see out there uh, involves impersonators who um, are trying to uh, sell themselves off as businesses or government entities. And they might send out a text or something like that saying that they're Amazon and your package hasn't been delivered. Um, so you need to click on this link or maybe you get a pop-up uh, message on your computer that's from Microsoft that says you, ne you need to do these things to protect your computer. And um, a lot of times the scammers will say that your account is frozen. And in order to protect it, you need to convert your, your money or whatever into cryptocurrency and then transfer it. Um, and then when you transfer it, you're unknowingly transferring it into the uh, to the scammers cryptocurrency wallet and then it, it's gone forever and they actually there are actually um some cryptocurrency atms out there like you could you could go and you could put us dollars in them and then the atm will give you like a sheet of paper or something that shows the value of the bitcoin or whatever cryptocurrency that you just bought with your us dollars but you know, if if the money, you know, went to a scam or something like that, then then your paper is useless at that point. And there are also QR codes. Um, some scammers will send QR codes and say, "Hey, send uh, your cryptocurrency to such and such um, digital wallet." That way, there are also fraudsters out there that do job scams, and these uh, typically involve listing like fake jobs. On websites or uh, where they say, you know, hey, uh, interested in hiring you for this position, but first you need to pay us this money to accomplish whatever X, Y, and Z. Um, and if if you're being recruited for a job where they require you to pay money up front, it's probably a scam. Um, there are also fake job postings that involve trying to recruit like cryptocurrency investors or to sell cryptocurrency and then they require people to to buy a certain amount of cryptocurrency up front and then that money goes away and uh the final type of kind of common cryptocurrency scam that we see out there involves blackmail where fraudsters will email or text someone and say hey i have some embarrassing or compromising information about you photos some videos or something. And unless you pay me, you know, a hundred Bitcoin, I'm going to release them in the public or put them on social media. So that type of conduct is, is a crime. It's criminal extortion. And if you ever come across anything like that, you, sh you should report it immediately to the FBI. So um, if you do come across things that um, look like scams, cryptocurrency scams, various different frauds, um, we encourage people to report them to our agency where we compile this information in a, net, a national database and we can take action based on those reports. So what you're seeing up there now is, is the main 
website to report fraud to the uh, FTC. You can make those reports in e English or in Spanish. And when you do that, uh, you help to protect everyone because you're giving, you know, advance notice of that this thing is out there and that hopefully action can be taken to stop other people from becoming victims to it. And if you do encounter what you believe to be a cryptocurrency scam, uh, there's some other government agencies that also handle these type of affairs. Um, one of them is the Commodity Futures Training Trading Commission. Um, and you see the, uh, the website there where you can uh, file a complaint. And also the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission um, also handles a lot of cryptocurrency uh, fraud and scams. So we encourage people to file similar complaints with the SEC. And if you're interested in learning more about cryptocurrency and scams and frauds that are out there, uh, you can see the, uh, the website that we have set up with that information on it. If you'd like to get periodic alerts about different type of cryptocurrency scams that are out there, we uh, have alerts that go out um, and you can sign up at that address there. Um, and you can also download and share different resources that we have at our agency to uh, kind of give some educational perspective um, to these topics. All right. Um, that's all I have for my main presentation. Daniel, we have time for um, questions and answers. I don't know if there's a way for people to ask those questions and me to hear them, or if you just want to repeat them or, or what.